Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to today's Grand Rounds presentation. Please remember to fill out the attendance record and also please remember to fill out the program evaluations and if you think of any topics or speakers that you'd like to have presented at Grand Rounds, please let us know and we'll work on providing you those. Uh, today it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stuart Christensen. Dr. Christensen uh, is board certified in cardiology and uh, internal medicine. He did his training here at Iowa State and then the University of Iowa and then the Mayo Clinic. In addition to his board certification, uh, he's also certified in uh, nuclear cardiology, echocardiography, and cardiac CT scanning. And he's here today to uh, 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 update uh, what I think is a really exciting new area. And uh, he's going to give us an update on novel anticoagulant and antiplatelet agents. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Christensen. Thanks, Steve. All right, well, this is a, a topic I get a lot of questions about and uh, I was asked to come speak about. Uh, it's something that uh, a lot of us interact with at various levels. I uh, spoke about this a couple of years ago here, and I know Dr. Ottoman gave a, a lecture about these anticoagulants just last year. So you've heard it from different perspectives. Uh, now we have a little bit more data, a few medications available. And uh, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the clinical perspectives and uh, particularly related to cardiology and atrial fibrillation with these medications. Just remember, I am a cardiologist. I'm hoping some of my colleagues from hematology sneak in so I can hand them, them the mic for all the tough questions. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, some of the newer anticoagulant and antiplatelet agents that are available that we've been using uh, recently in cardiology. We're going to look at some of the similarities and differences between these agents. Are there reasons to use one or the other in certain situ situations? And what patients might be appropriate for these versus what has been standard of care up until now? Uh, we'll try and center the discussion around uh, patients you might see in many of your practices. So you're in clinic and you have a 69-year-old woman that comes in complaining of palpitations. Just been a few weeks or maybe months, she's not sure, but she just notices her heart kind of flipping around a little bit. Doesn't really race. A little short of breath, maybe if she's going up the stairs, but it hasn't been a big problem. Um, just it doesn't feel right, so she comes in to see you about that. You take a listen, and indeed she's a little bit irregular on examination, so you do the electrocardiogram. Uh, so what do you see here? It's, the rate is, you know, 300, 150, 100, you know, 90 to 100 beats per minute, irregular. So it's not fast, but you can see there's some spikes that are a little closer together than others, so it's, it's irregular. So a bunch of irregular beats, is it atrial fibrillation? Well, atrial fibrillation is usually fast, isn't it? Um, not for everybody. So indeed, yes, this is atrial fibrillation, but with a controlled ventricular response, and that's why she's not having a lot of symptoms, just noticing some palpitations. So we don't really need to worry too much about rate control, because it's already rate controlled. You could talk to her about rate versus rhythm control. Do you want to put her back into sinus rhythm or not? But if you did that, you'd have to talk about anticoagulation. So really, that's where the focus uh, needs to start in taking care of this, is, is does she need anticoagulation? So let's get a little bit more history from her. So she has hypertension. Um, she takes medications for that, but it's well controlled. Doesn't have diabetes, no prior strokes or heart failure, doesn't smoke, really pretty healthy and active. Uh, just has hypertension. So what is the risk for stroke? And that's important if you're thinking about starting an anticoagulant, that's really one of the key questions. What is the risk? And we have a couple quick measures we can do right when we're sitting with the patient, just ask a few questions. Uh, the CHADS-2 score, or now more recently the CHADS-2 VASC score, are, are things we can talk about and just, I usually write it on a piece of paper so the patients can see why I'm doing this. And they have some the data when I'm telling them, you need a blood thinner, you need an anticoagulant, they understand why. Uh, and then you have to balance that. What is their risk for stroke? versus what is their risk for bleeding. And so we have another score called the HASBLED score that helps us understand their bleeding risk. And so we're going to just briefly touch on those. 
the CHADS-2 score has to do with these features. Does the patient have heart failure, systolic or diastolic heart failure? Is there hypertension, whether it's controlled or uncontrolled? Or have they had hypertension in the past? Are they over 75 years of age? Do they have diabetes? Or have they had a previous stroke or even a little TIA or mini stroke? And that counts for two points if you've had a stroke. Now this score has been around for decades now, and it's held true to time. It's just a real simple, easy way of doing an assessment. More recently, we've added a few other variables that seem to define risk a little bit better. So we still have age, but now you know it's a continuum. Your age or your risk for stroke goes up with age. It's not just right at 75, all of a sudden you have a, a, a new risk for stroke. But, so now they take that into account. You get one point for be, being between 65 and 75, another, another point or a total of two points if you're over 75. You also get a point for vascular disease. So if you've had carotid disease or peripheral vascular disease, you get a point for that. And if you're a female, I hate to say, but women with atrial fibrillation are at higher risk of having stroke than men. So you get an extra point for that. But whichever score you use, if you look at the numbers, which I'll show in a moment, if you have a score of two or higher, most of the time you're going to benefit from anticoagulation. Your risk of stroke outweighs the risk of bleeding on the blood thinners. And that risk of bleeding, as we're going to talk about, is usually 1% to 2% per year for most people. So if your risk of having a stroke is higher than 2%, per year, then we need to really think about using the anticoagulant. If you're less than that, have a score of 0 to 1, then we need to talk a little bit more about you know, what is the risk, how stable are you on your feet. You know, if you want to take a risk, do you want to take the risk of bleeding or stroke and those sorts of things. Um, this is where we get that number of 2% and, and uh, risk of stroke with these scores. So on top you have the CHADS-2 score, and this is using the heart failure, hypertension, age, those things we just talked about. Um, I didn't know I could draw a curved line up there, but it looks curved from here. Uh, this is, if you get a score above 1, the risk, and this is um, events, so strokes basically per 100 person years, starts to go up there above the risk of what the bleeding would be on an anticoagulant. And here it's, it's a little easier to understand because they have it in stroke rate per year. So what percent risk is there per year of having a stroke? And this is again, as you get to a score of two or higher, your risk of having a stroke in atrial fibrillation is two percent or more. So if you have, you know, you've had a stroke in the past, you have hypertension, you're 80 years old, a little bit of heart failure, you're a female, your risk of stroke is getting up here towards 10% per year. And that's where we're really worrying about uh, the risk and getting, getting the blood thinner started. So our patient we just talked about, if we use the old score, she had a score of 1. So you could debate, she's on the borderline, do you, do you give her an anticoagulant, do you give her aspirin or nothing? Uh, if we use the newer score, she still has the hypertension. She gets a point for being 69, and she's a female. So now she has a score of 3. And based on the information I just showed you, that would push us towards thinking about a blood thinner, as long as she wasn't at too high risk of bleeding. And that's where this has bled score comes in that is up on the screen now. We don't use that quite as often, but it's another thing just to get a general feeling as to what is their risk of bleeding. Do they have poorly controlled hypertension? meaning blood pressure is over 160. Do they have kidney disease or liver disease? Um, have they had previous strokes? And it, it's interesting because you'll see strokes and hyper, or age greater than 65, that's a risk for stroke and it's a risk for bleeding. So yeah, all of these things kind of go together. Uh, so you just have to make a clinical decision what you think uh, would benefit the patient many times. It's just a, a general way of looking at what their bleeding risk might be. So if you think their risk of stroke outweighs the risk of bleeding, and you're thinking about an anticoagulant, 
these are the agents that are clinically approved, oral agents, I should say. We also have Lovenox and other things, but we don't use those as often in the outpatient long-term setting. Um, we've had other lectures in the past talking about these, but we'll talk in more detail. The newer agents, the dabigatran is a direct thrombin inhibitor, and then we have the factor 10A inhibitors, sort of at the end of the cascade uh, of anticoagulation. Now, the warfarin has been around a long time. It's stood the test of time. It works. It prevents risk. We have numerous studies of atrial fibrillation saying we can reduce the risk of strokes if you're on warfarin. So it's a good medication, but it, it's a bit of a hassle. You have to watch what you're eating. It interacts with so many other medications. You have to come in and get it monitored. So we've been looking for alternatives for a long time. Now we seem to have some of those alternatives. Uh, this talks about some of the challenges with warfarin. There is a risk of bleeding, about 2% per year in most studies and clinical studies. Uh, it's about the same for all of the other agents. So all of the newer agents still have a risk of bleeding. You know, as you'll see in the data, it might be slightly less, but really, it's still about 2% per year. Um, the warfarin requires the monitoring. You need the INRs, as we talked about. Even in the best of clinical studies, the INR is therapeutic only about two-thirds of the time. And so you can imagine even out in practice, it, it's poorly controlled a lot of the time, so the patients are all over the place. So that's been one of the challenges with this medication. And as we talked about in the past, and um, Dr. Fleming mentioned to me up front uh, before, are we going to make sure people know not to use aspirin and aspirin plus Plavix all the time together? Because those do increase your risk of bleeding almost as much as warfarin does, especially if you're using them together. So just to say, well, I'll just use aspirin instead, you don't get as much benefit and you still have a bleeding risk with those medications. So our patient was concerned about the cost. We'll touch a little more on cost, but uh, warfarin is certainly less expensive than the newer agents. So she decided she was going to try that. But after trying it for a few months, she came in, her INRs were all over the place. She didn't like the diet. She didn't like coming in and getting it monitored because it was so variable. She was getting it checked every week. She came back to see me and just said, hey, let's try something different. So warfarin's out. What about these other alternatives? That's what we want to talk about today. So I want to just make a point here. This is an alternative in somebody who has non-valvular atrial fibrillation. So if you have a mechanical valve, if you've had rheumatic heart disease and had a mitral valve replacement, these newer agents have not been approved for that. In fact, with the dabigatran, there was a study just done in Europe saying they are at a higher risk of bleeding compared to warfarin. Uh, so if you have significant valvular disease, prosthetic heart valves, you're sticking on warfarin. Now, that may be because we just don't have the right dose figured out uh, for these patients. Uh, in the future, we may be able to use these newer agents in those patients, but right now, it's atrial fibrillation that's not due to valvular disease. I'm glad Dr. Ottoman just walked in, so if you have any questions about this <laughs> cascade, they go to him. I'm the simple cardiologist here. Uh, but you can see the direct Factor 10A inhibitors and direct uh, thrombin inhibitors are later on in the cascade. Intrinsic and extrinsic pathways both funnel through this, and that's, that's where these agents are acting. These are the approved indications, and it seems like studies are coming out all the time. Just this week's New England Journal had two studies regarding uh, two of these uh, agents compared to warfarin in um, reduction in thromboembolic events and DVTs, and pulmonary emboli. So the indications keep changing, but basically all three of these agents are approved for non-valvular atrial fibrillation. Some of them are approved for treatment of DVTs or pulmonary emboli. Some are approved for prophylaxis uh, after surgery, but not each agent is approved for everything. And it's, sometimes it's different doses uh, for the different um, modalities are using, and it is some of them are approved in other countries or in Canada as opposed to the U.S. Uh, more studies are ongoing, obviously, each company is looking for their market share, so this will be a, an ever-changing uh, 
field, but right now I'm going to focus more on the nonvalvular atrial fibrillation. So let's talk about the dabigatran. You may know that as Pradaxa. It's the agent that's been out the longest for a few years now. Um, its half-life is 12 to 14 hours. And after you take a dose, it reaches its maximum effect in just a couple of hours. Which, you know, what does that mean? Compare that to warfarin, which we've used in the past. The half-life of warfarin is days, you know, one to three days compared to a half day. That's a, that's a big difference. And the maximum effect, if you take a dose of warfarin, it's not really taking an effect for, you know, days as well. And so it, it, this has pluses and minuses. It means if you're trying to get somebody therapeutic, you can start it and they're, they're getting up to speed in a hurry. If you're bleeding, you can stop it. It's going to go away and much faster than the other medications or than warfarin would. But at the same time, if a patient's skipping a dose, their ther therapeutic level is going to be uh, lower than if they were on warfarin where they'd hang out a little bit higher for a while. So um, pluses and minuses to that. Now the, the dabigatran has twice daily dosing as compared to warfarin that you take once a day. And a big thing with this medication that I want you to remember, this particular one is really dependent on renal excretion. So if you have kidney disease, you need to adjust the dose or not use this. You need to monitor kidney function. They're at higher risk of bleeding if you use this medication and they have kidney problems. This is some of the adjustments in dosing uh, based on creatinine clearance. Uh, reduce the dose to 75 milligrams twice a day if it's 15 to 30. And if you're less than that or you're on dialysis, I would not use this medication. It's also recommended that you check the creatinine before you start the medication and then if they're elderly or have reduced renal function, you check it at least annually after that to make sure that's stable and their bleeding risk doesn't go up. The other thing about this medication is it hasn't been studied as much in the extremes of body weight. So if you have really thin people or the multiple Iowa unit obese people that we see occasionally around here, uh, it hasn't been as well studied there whereas some of the other medications have. The RELY trial is the, the initial trial that uh, was used uh, to help get this approved for treatment of atrial fibrillation. Almost 20,000 patients. Interesting, they used 110 milligrams and 150 milligrams, whereas the clinical doses available are 75 and 150. We've never really studied the 75 milligram dose, but that's what the FDA has approved. Uh, but the, the higher dose seemed to be more effective than the warfarin at reducing strokes or embolic events, and the lower dose was at least as good. It wasn't any worse than the warfarin. And this, this is uh, one of the main slides. The hazard ratio is basically the no number of events, strokes, or embolic events. So the lower the curve, the flatter the curve, the better the outcomes. And so that's where you want to be. The higher dose of the dabigatran looks to have a better outcome here and, and was a little uh, statistically significant in this case. The bleeding, um, you can just see slightly less bleeding. Not a big difference, but slightly less bleeding with the, the dabigatran when compared to the warfarin. And no statistically significant difference in uh, mortality. So people don't necessarily live longer by taking this medication, although the trend is certainly in the right direction. It doesn't look worse. If you can remember, a couple years ago, after this medication came out, all of a sudden it was in the press and you couldn't be watching your television without seeing some lawyer on there saying, you know, if you've used this medication and you've had bleeding, call me. I'll take care of you. And I just shake my head. It, it's an anticoagulant. You're going to bleed. You know, there's a bleeding risk. It's inherent with using the medication. Uh, but that did prompt further evaluation. The FDA did go back and, and do a post-marketing safety review, looked at a lot of insurance data, and basically has come up with that uh, result on the bottom there, that there, there's no more GI bleeds, gastrointestinal bleeds, or, or intracranial uh, 
bleeds with the dabigatran compared to warfarin. And the, the outcomes are about the same as they were in the Relive trial that we just got done talking about. So you need to be careful using it. You need to know what the kidney function is. Uh, creatinine clearance goes down. Even though the number looks okay, creatinine looks okay with age, creatinine clearance goes down, you may need to adjust the dose. And yes, you may have some people that bleed with the medication that you do with warfarin or anything else that we would be using in these patients. Um, conversion, that's a big question we have. How do you convert from one dose to another? And I have a few slides in here uh, that you can just keep with you on your handout that will help you sort that out. But remember, this is a fairly short-acting medication. In maximum fact is just a few hours after taking it, whereas warfarin lasts longer. So that's why we have these conversions. So if you're going from warfarin, like our patient is, and wanting to convert over to something else, you can go ahead and stop that warfarin. And then you want to monitor and see when is that INR below 2? You know, when, is, when have they lost the therapeutic value of that? And then that's when I would start the new medication. So probably a few days before that INR dips below 2, and then start the dabigatran. Whereas if you're going the other direction, you're on dabigatran, but you want to switch back to warfarin, maybe you have some side effect. One of the most common side effects is dyspepsia. About 11% of people get this just funny feeling in the stomach. It's better if you take this with food, but that's one of the more common reasons people want to stop this medication. So let's say she tries that, wants to go back to warfarin. Um, then you need to overlap for about three days because it's going to take warfarin for a while. It's going to take that a while to build up. Remember, it, it takes a while to have that maximum effect and therapeutic level. So you overlap for three days unless you have renal dysfunction. Because remember, the, the dabigatran sticks around longer if you have kidney disease. So if, if you have a low creatinine clearance, you may only need to overlap one or two days. Um, this acts, you can think of it similar to an oxaparin. So it's a twice-a-day medication. If you're taking a low molecular weight heparin twice a day, you take a dose in the morning, you decide you're going to start them on an oral agent with dabigatran that day. They get their shot in the morning, don't give them their shot in the evening, start the dabigatran. You can kind of just exchange one for the other if you're switching from the low molecular weight heparins. So that's one of the medications. Now we have three of them that are out there. They're all similar. Um, so you're not comparing apples and oranges. Uh, they're all apples, but they have some differences. This is the first one that's out there. We have the post-marketing safety review that said, you know, even out in clinical practice, it seems to be as safe as we thought it was in the research studies beforehand. So, you know, that that's kind of the, the standard um, it, alternative to warfarin that's been looked at so far. But what about these other agents? So the rivaroxaban. That's the one that's been out uh, for a while now, over a year as well. When I see people sent to me on one of these medications, this tends to be what they're taking. I don't understand that necessarily. Um, I think the, the marketing people have gotten hold, especially the um, family practice and primary care providers outside of the main clinic. I see it, um, a lot of other people starting this medication. It's not good or bad, it's just an interesting observation I've had. This is approved for other reasons as well. That initial slide for indications, this is the one that is, is approved for DVTs, pulmonary emboli. And the other thing we'll talk about is this is once a day. So that's a, that's a definite benefit to this medication. It has about the same half-life. Remember, dabigatran was 12 to 14 hours. This is 7 to 11 hours. This is not as dependent on renal excretion. So some minor, minor adjustments at times that we'll talk about, but it's not as big of a deal if their creatinine changes a little bit. And this has been looked at in the really thin or overweight patient populations and seems to be uh, about the same. You don't need to adjust dose, just use it as otherwise planned. The ROCKET AF trial, similar to the RELY trial with the dabigatran, this is the, the main study used. Now look at the, the patients, they're pretty high risk. Their CHAD score was three or higher. So they didn't have any patients with a one or a two. These patients were at higher risk of having strokes. 
and it showed that this was uh, not any worse than warfarin. You could debate whether it's better or not, uh, not statistically significantly better. Uh, curve looks very similar, though, to the uh, previous trial we looked at with the davigatran. Looking at the event index, lower curve is better, and uh, no worse than warfarin, trend towards being better. Conversions, this one, it's recommended that you actually start this, and since it's once a day, start it when the INR goes below 3 as opposed to 2. Um, and the difference, and I underlined it and I'll have another slide, but this and Apixaban, the other agent I'm going to talk about, have black box warnings on them. In the trials, the, when the patients stopped those medications, they were at higher risk of having a stroke. So they recommend if you're starting, or if you're stopping the medication, you need to start something else. Use some bridging um, or just monitor them. Now, I think a lot of it's trial design, and there's a lot of debate about this, and, and I'd be open for you know, any of the hematologists or other experts' opinions on this. But I don't know if there's a reason when you stop this medication that you're at a higher risk of having a stroke. I don't know that there's a rebound effect although I don't know that there's not. Um, but I think, as with warfarin, if you stop the medication, you're not protected and you have a higher risk of stroke. And in the RELY trial where they used the dabigatran, they actually, it was part of the trial where they did a little bit of better bridging and some of that overla overlap I talked about. So it may be just a difference in trial designs. But just so you know, there is a warning that if you stop this, medi this medication, there may be a slightly higher risk of stroke or an embolic event if they're off the medication. And this is that warning. This is exactly how it's stated on the package insert. There was an increased risk of stroke noted upon discontinuation of this medication in clinical trials in patients with atrial fibrillation. Consider the addition of an alternative anticoagulant therapy when discontinuing this medication for reasons other than bleeding. All right. So now, We've talked about a second medication. Uh, this one hasn't been out quite as long, but it seems to be a new guy on the block. It's being uh, readily accepted. It's once a day. Uh, it's kind of moved to the forefront in a lot of people's minds. This is the newest medication, Apixaban. It's actually been in trials for a while. We've done some of the trials here. Uh, but it's, this was just FDA approved within the last couple of months. And we've, I've been getting lots of literature thrown my way to look at this. Um, this is still twice a day. And there, there is some interaction with kidney function. So, but it's not just direct. So if you have two of these three features that I mentioned, if, if you're elderly over 80 years of age, if you weigh less than 60 kilograms, or if you have a creatinine greater than 1.5, if you have two of those three, then they recommend a dose reduction. Or if you're on a couple of these medications, mainly the, the fungal antibiotics, that, uh, antifungals that increase, that interact a little bit. So we recommend a dose adjustment with that. But not nearly as many dose adjustments as you would have with warfarin. Again, on the left, that's looking at the same sort of thing we looked at with the other two graphs, strokes or systemic emboli. Um, the curves look similar to what we've looked at before. And on the right side, that graph has to do with bleeding. So the lower curve, the apixaban curve, looks like less bleeding with this agent. And that was statistically significant. And the other thing, let me just go back, the other thing that the marketing people are going to tell you is this did have statistically significant reduction in mortality. So fewer people died if they were taking a Pixaban as, as opposed to Warfarin. Uh, again, the Dabigatran, I showed you that data earlier where it was 0.051 was a p-value, meaning it was close to being significant there as well. So I don't know that this is necessarily more protective uh, at preventing death than the others, but it did reach statistical significance in the, the main trial that was done. Some of the conversions very similar to what we've seen with the other agents. Um, when you're going 
when you're stopping a Pixaban, as I'll show you in the next slide, there is the black box warning recommending starting another alternative anticoagulant. And here's that same warning. It reads very similar to the one we saw with the Rivox, Rivaroxaban, or, or Elto is the other one. So it's still in the background, uh, this new one is just coming out. Um, it has looked good in the studies, but it, the question is, is it going to be picked up? How do you know which one to use? Uh, are, is one better than another? We don't have a lot of, we don't have any real comparison data, one agent to another right now. Um, certain people, if you have kidney disease, I would stay away from the dabagatran and consider one of the others. To be honest, I write down all three agents on a card for many of my patients and say, talk to your you know, insurance provider and see what they're going to cover best for you because it's hard for me to keep track and it is an ever-changing thing. Um, the newest one, the Apixaban, it is tier three on many coverages yet because it just came out uh, within the last month or two. So it hasn't been picked up yet. I anticipate it will be just like the others. They do have savings cards for all three of these medications, but they are not going to help your Medicare patients. Um, I tried to call around a little bit. I ask my patients, but a lot of times they don't even know how much they're paying. All of these agents are over $200 a month if you're cash pay, so they're expensive. Through insurance, it's usually a branded copay. Many times it's $30 to $40 a month, but it, it can depend on who's covering. Uh, what insurance, and if you're in the donut hole or not for a lot of our patients. So let's go back to our patient that we had when we started. Remember, she was 69 years old, came in with palpitations. We found that she had the atrial fibrillation. She tried the warfarin, just was having troubles getting her INR control, didn't like coming in to get it monitored, so she wanted to switch. Uh, we started a new anticoagulant. You can choose which one we started, uh, whichever was your favorite one for the day, I guess. She didn't have kidney disease. Any of them would be reasonable alternatives. Unfortunately, she slipped on the ice. Welcome to Iowa. She came in. She had a hip fracture. She had a hemoglobin that was already down to 9 when you're checking her in the emergency room. It was normal when we checked her before, so she's bleeding. And she has a creatinine that's pretty normal still. So what are we going to do? Now, if you see a few surgeons sitting in the room, and they, they love all of these medications, of course. Well, she's sitting there at the ER docs wondering, you know, this was just started just recently, but I don't even know if she's taking it or not. How, how can I tell if she's taking it? You know, I don't have an INR. We don't monitor that. You know, she tells me, well, I, I take something. I'm not really sure. How do you know? Well, then the hospitalist sees the patient. He goes down to nine. He wants to know, how can I get this bleeding stopped so we can get the patient ready for surgery? And then the surgeon just wants to get the patient to surgery. You just tell me when it's safe. You know, what do I, what do I need to do? When, she, when can she go? When is it safe? We get those questions all the time. So that's what we're going to talk about for a few minutes here. All of these agents, uh, it says right in the, the package insert, monitoring is not recommended. Just like your high blood pressure medicine or whatever else you take, you, you take the dose and you assume if you take it, it's going to work and you have to you know, encourage their compliance and make sure they take it. You can monitor it. You can check an INR and uh, please let me know if, uh, Dr. Ottoman, if you have any other thoughts, but you can monitor it with the, or you I shouldn't say you can mo monitor it. You can check an INR and an INR will often be elevated if they're taking it. So if you're an ER doc, you want to know are they taking something? You can take this. If it's absolutely normal, I think it's unlikely that they're taking the medication. But you can't really follow it. It doesn't monitor what their dose is, and you, you can't you know, follow it over time. For the dabagatran, the recommendation would be to do this Eastern clotting time, which is a test we don't even do here. The thrombin time would probably be the best and quickest test to get here. Um, that can be a few hours. You can get that done a relatively quick turnaround. Or a PTT can give you a, an estimate. For the rivaroxaban or a pixaban, the recommendation in all of the uh, literature is to check antifactor 10A levels. 
But those are send outs. Those are going to take days to come back. And so we don't have a real easy way of checking on that. Do you have any other thoughts? No, I don't. Uh, I mean, I think the uh, Deborah Grattan uh, uh, the Brahman time is actually pretty sensitive. So the question is, I'll let you mess with that rather than me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I haven't studied uh, the uh, factor eight inhibitors very much, but in looking into the dabigatrin, uh, there's actually uh, good evidence that thrombin time is a very, what you really want in this situation is a sensitive test. What test is gonna tell me if the patient is at risk or not? And with the dabigatrin, the thrombin time is actually quite good at that, and it is readily available. It's easy to do, uh, and so certainly a, a patient who comes in on Pradaxa, you, you don't know if they're taking it or you're not quite sure about their renal function and you'd like to know, you know, is it safe now? Uh, I think a thrombin time is a reasonable test to do. Um, I, frankly, I haven't read as much about the factor uh, 10 inhibitors, and so I don't know if there's anything that we can readily do that will give you the same uh, reassurance or not. Would there be benefit to following that? So you check it in the ER, the thrombin time is high, you want to know later that day or the next day, is it worth checking it again to see if it's down and does that tell you if it's safe to go? Surgery? Right. So, on a patient who's on the uh, the uh, factor two inhibitor, the thrombin inhibitor, the Pradaxa, I think that is legitimate. So, if it's an older person that comes in and their renal function isn't as good, um, I think it's absolutely reasonable to check a thrombin time the day they come in and check another thrombin time the next morning to make certain that they are metabolizing the drug appropriately. And and so, I think that's legitimate. Um, it's the other drugs that I, I can't give you advice about. But the thrombin time is something I think that um, that you can okay. use to make good clinical decisions. Okay. Um, do you know if they're developing an assay for the anti-factor 10A that we could purchase to use in-house? Jennifer, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, the last time I was looking into this, there was actually interest in uh, doing uh, a urine test. The idea that the drug, if they're excreted renally, that the uh, a urine screening test might actually be uh, a better way of measuring. But that was uh, that was in a German article. Uh, in English by, by uh, German researchers, and there's nothing clinically available to measure uh, either apixaban or rivaroxaban. Yeah, that seems less than helpful if they have renal failure. Yep. So. Yeah. So this is what we have based on you know, data and recommendations so far. So it's a, it is a challenging situation. The thing to remember is these are medications which have short half-lives, they're going to go away relatively soon, as opposed to the warfarin that's going to be around for a long time. And that takes me to the next slide. So what if they are bleeding? The first thing to do is stop the anticoagulant. It makes sense, but it really is effective in these cases because you know, the half-life is only 7 or 12 hours. It, it's going to go away. You, know, you wait a day, the dose, uh, as long as their renal function is okay and, and all of that, it's going to go away and, and their bleeding risk should be less fairly soon after that. There is not an antidote. So you don't have the vitamin K that you can give as you do with warfarin. You don't have the protamine that you can give with heparin. So you don't have something to reverse this real easily. And uh, when I talk about these medications with my surgical colleagues, they're not very happy about that, and that's understandable. Uh, Dabigatran. Uh, can be dialyzed. About 60% can come off with dialysis. The other two, no, but for the Pradaxa, Devagatran, dialysis can be effective. So particularly if you have somebody with renal failure or it's going to be sticking around longer, something to think about. It's going to take you a while to 
get a line, line in and get dialysis initiated. So how clinically useful it's going to be, most patients I don't think would need that. But that is an option in certain situations. Uh, you can just support them with red cells if they're bleeding, maybe some FFP. The prothrombin complex concentrate is something that's recommended for a couple of the agents. The recomb recombinant factor 7A. Now, one thing I, I guess I don't know an answer for, and I don't know if you or Dr. Johnson or anybody knows, how long does that take to, if you think you want to give somebody factor 7A? Is that something that's readily available, or is that going to take a day or two to find? I know that 7A is tens of thousands of dollars, and so it's not something that you keep in the pharmacy and let yeah. go bad on the shelf. Um, and I don't know how, I don't know, I'm presuming that among the, the two hospitals in Des Moines that maybe they've decided between themselves to keep some on hand or, um, but it's not one that we keep on hand here, it's just too expensive. The, uh, the FIBA, the factory bypassing factor, the prothrombin complex, um, oh, I think we keep that on hand for patients who have uh, hemophilia with an inhibitor uh, from that standpoint. But don't forget, um, the converse of, of your blood is too thin is your blood is too thick. And there are lots and lots of cases of patients who've suffered a stroke or a significant pulmonary embolism having received these uh, reversing agents. So it's uh, it's not like vitamin K, it's not risk-free. Yeah. So I think the standard for most of your patients that are gonna come in, you're gonna hold the medication. Again, it seems straightforward, but stop the medication. It's gonna be cleared, and they're gonna be safe for surgery soon after that. And you just have to support them through that. Your IV fluids, transfusions, whatever is necessary. For, for the majority of the patients you're gonna see. Uh, this is just a little bit of data on the conversions uh, prior to elective surgery. For most of these, it's one to two days. It's recommended as opposed to the you know, four or five days with warfarin. You have to stop before you go to surgery. One to two days uh, before surgery for this. Uh, if they have uh, reduced renal function and they're on the dabigatran, you may need to stop it a little bit earlier. The one thing that they comment on in the inserts and all the data is if you're going to get neuroanesthesia, if you're going to get a spinal, something like that, you don't want to bleed in there. So you want to stop that probably four or five days before taking this. So um, just a couple comparisons. So no monitoring with these newer medications, no dietary restrictions, you, know, you don't have to worry about eating your green leafy vegetables and then change of season, you're not eating as many. Uh, there's many fewer drug interactions with these medications, so you can use the antibiotics for the most part without difficulties. The downsides, the cost is a big downside. Uh, there is no antidote as we just got done visiting about. It's a twice daily dosing for a couple of these medications as opposed to the once a day. And, and I'm not sure on the, the clinical significance of this, but the, the black box warnings on two of the medications that there is this slightly higher risk of strokes or embolic events if you're stopping the medication and not continuing something else. This is in your handout, just a, uh, just a comparison of the studies. So all of them seem to show benefit. No red flags with any of these agents compared to warfarin. And just... Uh, a brief overview on some of the adjustments in the dosing based on renal function. Uh, the caveat is the apixaban on the bottom there. Remember, that was the one that said if they have two of the three. So let's say you have the reduced creatinine clearance and you're over 80 or you're under 60 kilograms, then you might reduce the dose to 2.5 milligrams. And none of these agents should be used if you're in stage renal disease. So you're, you're stuck with warfarin, but even warfarin has an increased risk of bleeding in those patients. And so I also had, um, was going to talk about antiplatelet agents, but I knew this would be the bigger topic. It's what I get all the questions about. So I'm not going to spend much time on this. Uh, these are the newer agents on the bottom. 
Clopidogrel is now generic, which is a big deal. The Ticlid we don't use anymore. The Effient is the Presugrel, and the Berlinta or Ticagrelor is kind of the, the new one. It's been out over a year now, but just not used as much yet. And the big thing is Clopidogrel is now cheap and generic. And so it, when the new ones came out, the Plavix went generic, and we're still tending to use that more. Uh, a lot of it's for cost reasons. I won't go through the details there, um, but the big thing is clopidogrel is now generic, and we have a, uh, lots of data to say how that's helpful. Um, question of using this with stents. The guidelines still say dual antiplatelet therapy, aspirin plus clopidogrel or another agent for um, 12 months after we put a drug-eluting stent in. Real-world data says that for some of the newer generation stents, we're probably safe at three to six months. But our guidelines still say 12 months. So that's what we recommend. But if somebody comes in and they're bleeding with one of the newer generation drug-eluting stents, you know, if, if it's six months out, we may say it's okay to stop. It's, or it's safer than it was five, eight years ago. For Sugro, um, again, very similar to Clopidogrel or Plavix. Um, big thing with this one is it seems to have a little more benefit in diabetics. So our young diabetic patients, we may, that's where we really focus on this. We don't use it if they've had a stroke in the past or if they're very thin or elderly. And this is the newer medication. It inhibits the platelets even more. A little higher risk of bleeding, but a little more effective. A lot of patients notice the sensation of shortness of breath. Not that they're having ischemia or any other cause, but it's just an effect of the medication. They feel short of breath. So there's a significant amount, number of patients that have stopped this, and it's, it is more expensive. So we don't use that a whole lot. So those are uh, the medications that we've talked about today and some of the uses in some of our patients. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have.